Okay, good morning, everybody. Why don't we get started? Okay, a couple of announcements. Um, first, I wanted to update you on the James Franco event. Um, so uh, this is an interview that um, I... Okay, okay. Um, so I told you at the beginning of the semester that I had proposed um, to James Franco, who's a faculty member here, to do a, um, uh, a presentation for all NYU students called um, uh, Understanding the Monkey Mind, a conversation with James Franco and Wendy Suzuki um, uh, in, in response to his uh, uh, movie, um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I'm sure he's fascinated with the monkey mind and all those things associated with it. But he agreed. He thought it was a great idea. And so um, we had wanted to try and get a date for this semester, but it didn't turn out because he's not going to be in New York very much this semester. But I got a promise from his booker that um, we would find a date in the spring. So watch out for the um, announcements. It's going to be a university-wide event. So hopefully um, there'll be enough seats for everybody. Um, so that's, uh, that's for next semester. Um, next news, not so happy, uh, next Wednesday is our second midterm exam. Um, and this week in lab, there is a lab this week, no lab quiz, but you're going to have another whole session devoted to review for next Wednesday's exam. Um, there's also going to be a review session tomorrow, uh, an extra review session tomorrow night from from 6 o'clock to 7.30, and where will this review session be? 815 Meyer Building on 4 Washington Place. For all of you that went to the last one, it's the same, um, uh, same room, same building, just down the street this way. Okay, um, same format as the last exam. Expect true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, and a couple of different kinds of um, uh, short answer questions, kind of short, short answer questions and medium short answer questions where we'll ask you to, to um, describe these answers in, in three or four sentences or maybe even a full paragraph. So um, same kind of uh, format, new topic of, topic of course, where, where we focused on sensory systems, motor systems. Oh, this is very important. It, uh, we will cover all exams, including next Monday's exam. So we'll, we'll finish the motor system today. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to go over motor diseases. That will be covered. Next Monday, we're going to be, uh, will be <clears throat> the first lecture in the learning and memory part of the uh, course, and that lecture will be covered on the exam, OK? So everything up to Wednesday, um, next Wednesday, will be covered on the exam. Any questions about that? No? OK, great. So um, the other thing that I wanted to um, just emphasize to you is um, to point out to you something that you've probably all already realized, and that is the difference between what's um, stated in your book that you're all using as, as a reference for this class and what real neuroscientists study. Okay, So um, if you take the book, it's like a Bible of neuroscience. These are all the facts that we know about neuroscience. And a lot of the facts you've learned. You've learned about facts about neuroanatomy, names of structures, where they are, the facts of the pathways of the visual system, the somatosensory system, um, the facts of how action potentials are propagated. Those are all facts. But what neuroscientists like myself do is we're actually asking the new questions. And I want to make sure that you are aware of what those questions really are. So for example, let's take the visual system. That is the, 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 um, uh, the sensory system that we know the most about. You learn so many different facts about the sensory systems, the pathways, the rods and cones. You might think, OK, I have to learn all this. There's nothing more to learn. But just to give you a flavor, just recently, in fact, this year, at this year's Society for Neuroscience meeting that's happening um, November, starting November 10th, um, there is a woman who won a, a big prize called the Lindsley Prize, prize for the best thesis, di dissertation thesis in um, behavioral neuroscience. And she won this prize for identifying a whole new visual pathway, a whole new set 
of retinal ganglion cells. There are not a lot of them, not nearly as many of them as rods and cones, but it turns out there's a specialized subset that are important for what's called photo entrainment. That is, um, being able to detect whether it's light or dark and modulating your, your behavioral state. Is it nighttime? Should I be sleeping? Is it bright out? Should I be active? And there is a specialized pathway that is not important for visualizing your face compared to your face or you know, uh, spatial relationships in the visual world, but is only important for bringing light information in to uh, the parts of the brain important for determining your general uh, patterns of kind of biorhythm functions. Whole new pathway. Completely new discovery. She did not do it on her own. There was a whole lab and team, but she wrote a beautiful, beautiful thesis on this. Completely new pathway. And so it's not just like, oh, we know everything about the visual system. We're still learning things about something as well studied as the visual system. And what we're going to be talking about today is the motor system, even more unknown, because when we talk about sensory systems, this is just kind of uh, sensory passive information coming in, and we talk about the fact that we're not seeing everything out there. We're seeing a compilation of things. We are filtering things. Um, we're filtering things in our auditory system, so our bat would hear different things than we would hear. Um, an eagle sees a different scene that we see. Why? Because he has such more precise vision than we do. It would be a revelation to see what an eagle sees. It's very, very different. But still, relatively passive. These things are coming in. Now we're starting to uh, look at the motor system. This is not a sensory information. This is not sensory information coming in. This is something generated by us. I can decide to pick up this pointer, press the button, and get my little red dot up there. How does my brain do this? This is free will we're talking about. We're talking about the brain areas that we are controlling to do what we want. Okay. So if everybody, just for a second, everybody sit up really, really straight. Oh, okay. Everybody can do that. Shoulders back, sitting up. Everybody has the free will to do that, OK? That was your decision. What we're going to be talking about today is exactly what happens in your brain when you do that. Do I know what free will is? From a neuroscience perspective, I don't. But we're going to talk about the pathways that we do know about how you are all able just to do that, just to do a simple thing of sitting up straight in your chair. OK, so we're going to uh, continue on where we left off last time. We talked about all the muscles in, um, in your body. Uh, everybody knows what muscles are, and you just, you just uh, uh, stimulated a whole bunch of them, particularly in your core, in your abs, in your back, to do that sitting up straight thing. Those are slow twitch muscles. We talked about fast twitch and slow twitch. Those, those muscles that help maintain our posture are the ones that, that continue, that can fire for a long, long time. And even those get tired, as we know, as we get tired in a lecture and we start to slouch and we start to move back in our chairs. But um, um, all of those muscles are the ones that you just activated here. Each of the muscles are made up of lots of individual muscle fibers. And the individual muscle fibers that we talked about are made up of two key elements that you need to know about. Actin, which is the thinner element, the blue strands here, and myosin, the thicker element, which is the thick thing in the middle. And uh, muscles, what they do is contract. And so what happens is uh, the myosin uh, um, hooks on to the actin and pulls it together. And that's how a muscle like the bicep can um, contract and you can, uh, um, you can flex um, your arm uh, with the contraction of the bicep. Okay, we talked about fast twitch muscles, slow twitch muscles. Uh, the prototypical fast twist, twitch muscle was your eye movement, uh, your, your eye muscles controlled by cranial nerves, okay? And so those are very fast, they're very precise, but they don't have to lift a heavy load. Your eye is very light and you, they don't have to be lifting things like big books, okay? Um, slow twitch muscles are not nearly as fast and precise and, and, and can turn on a dime or can contract on a dime, but they are more resistant to fatigue. Those are the muscles that are helping you maintain your posture, your abdominal muscles, your back muscles. Um, another good analogy is the muscles that um, sprinters use. So we talked about the fact that uh, dark meat in 
the, um, in the chicken that you eat is uh, a lot of them are slow twitch muscles. These are the ones that are maintained for a long time. But within the leg, there are, in fact, both fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. The fast twitch muscles are those muscles that help you help the runner um, 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 kick off at the beginning of the race. When that, when that gun sounds, those fast twitch muscles are the ones that um, contract rapidly and um, on a dime. But it's the slow twitch muscles get that, that gets the runner through the main part of the course. Um, so again, both of these are acting together. Okay. So what is actually controlling the muscles? And that's where we get into the central nervous system, um, two special muscles called motor neurons. In fact, we're going to be focusing on, um, we're actually going to be talking about two types of motor neurons. One is the alpha motor neuron. And those are the neurons that are controlling all our striated muscles, our voluntary muscles. So for example, the heart and the stomach. Those are muscles, but those are smooth muscles. Those are controlled by um, uh, uh, unconscious, autonomic, and uh, the autonomic nervous system. Striated muscles, biceps, triceps, quadriceps, hamstrings, are all striated muscles and controlled by alpha motor neurons. Where are the alpha motor neurons? Alpha motor neurons live in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So we're going back to the spinal cord and um, hitting kind of the second part of the spinal cord. Let me just jump here. Here is our nice spinal cord again. Here is the dorsal uh, uh, um, horn of the uh, um, uh, spinal cord, and here's the ventral horn. Um, the ventral horn right here, this gray matter where cell bodies are, these are where the uh, primary alpha motor neurons live. Those neurons are sending those axons out this root. It's the ventral root of the spinal cord. Remember the dorsal root. What, what comes through the dorsal root? Sensory information, right. And what is sitting right here in this dorsal root ganglion? What's in there? <coughs> Cell bodies. Cell bodies of what? of neurons. What kind of neurons are they? What are they doing? This was the sensory part. So remember, these are the cell bodies of those neurons that are going out and sensing all of the uh, uh, sensory information from our body. Remember those, those um, all, uh, the Piscinian corpuscles, uh, Ruffini's corpuscles? Uh, those are um, uh, connecting to the afferent input um, of these primary sensory neurons in the uh, um, dorsal root ganglion. And the axons of these neurons here are going through the dorsal root and then going up into those sensory pathways. That's half of the spinal cord, the sensory half. Now we're finally getting to the ventral half, the motor half, where we have the cell bodies of the, um, uh, of the alpha motor neurons sitting right here and making up this ventral horn of the spinal cord. Again, these neurons, their axons are going out towards the ventral root, and then they come together. So the spinal nerve, remember, the 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now we're going, going back to the very beginning of our lectures. Those 31 pairs of spinal nerves going all the way up and down your spine are made up of both sensory um, inputs from the periphery, um, whose cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglion, this, this uh, uh, lump right here, and the um, uh, motor neuron axons that are going out to stimulate the neurons, OK? So what happens when you cut a spinal nerve? What would happen if you cut the spinal nerve and it's, uh, it's uh, um, innervating the arms? Let's say one pair of spinal neuron innervates the arms. What would happen if you cut this? You would be paralyzed. What else? So you couldn't move because you're cutting the motor neurons, but what else? You couldn't sense anything. So you lose all sensory and motor actions for this part of the body that this nerve is innervating, okay? Both sensory and motor, okay? And so it's, it's 
it, it's that way because you have both sensory inputs coming in and, and motor neurons going out this one individual nerve. So that's why you don't want to have um, nerve damage in your spinal cord. You have motor problems and you have sensory problems. Now, if I only went in and lesioned the dorsal root ganglion cells, then I would have purely sensory problems. If I cut the dorsal roots right here, I would only have motor problems, okay? So you should, you should have a, a 3D understanding of this spinal cord because we've gone over it at multiple different points during the class, and you should be able to understand that uh, or, or predict that if I cut, if I damage the cells here, what would happen? If I cut the spinal cord here, what would happen? If I cut the nerves here, what would happen? What would be the prediction? Does everybody get that? Does everybody have a clear idea of what would happen in those different situations? Yes, question. Uh, so the primary optic motor neurons are in the ventral horn? Are in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And the dorsal part of the spinal cord is primarily sensory, okay? That's where the sensory pathways are coming. Sensory uh, neurons that are helping to convey sensory information are in this dorsal part of the horn. And the ventral part of the spinal cord, the ventral horn and the ventral part of the spinal cord are, um, are, uh, uh, are dedicated to motor uh, functions. Any other questions? Okay, great. So motor neurons, um, uh, so those motor neurons are like any other neurons, they generate action potentials. And the action potentials in these alpha motor neurons travel down the motor neuron that branches into many terminals near its target. Now this target of a motor neuron is a muscle, okay? It's not another neuron, it is going to terminate in a muscle and it's action potentials <laughs> from the motor neuron that allows your muscles to contract. So my, my neurons, my neurons probably in the mid of my back are contracting as I am uh, flexing, um, uh, sorry, my, as I'm contracting my bicep muscle. Um, and the neurotransmitter that this motor neuron uses at the level of the muscle is acetylcholine, okay? So here is, um, a, uh, a blow up of an alpha motor neuron. It's the cell body. It's just to show how many different inputs there are to uh, the motor neuron. The axon is coming out here. It has lots of dendrites. And we're going to talk about uh, the major uh, uh, input to this motor neuron in a second. What controls this motor neuron that goes out to actually uh, contract a muscle? Okay. So, but first, before I do that, I want to talk about um, the uh, uh, actual uh, um, uh, transmission of the action potentials from the motor neuron to the muscles. And that happens at what's, at what's called the neuromuscular junction. And that is where the neuro motor neuron terminals uh, um, and the mo uh, muscle fiber meet, okay? Um, this is a synapse like any other synapse except the postsynaptic part is not another, another neuron. It happens to be um, a muscle. And the uh, uh, effect of acetylcholine is to actually help that muscle contract. That actin and myosin is gliding up against each other and contracting because there's uh, acetylcholine in the vicinity. Um, neuromuscular junction is a very, very effective synapse because almost every single action potential elicits a contraction. Um, an important concept is the concept of a motor unit. A motor unit is a, in a, is a single motor neuron's axon in all of its target fibers. So a motor unit are all the muscles that a single um, a motor neuron is contracting, okay? And that can be uh, seen as analogous to something we talked about in the sensory system, in the somatosensory system. Remember what I talked about? A dermatome is a part of a skin innervated by a particular spinal nerve. So we're not talking about individual uh, sensory neurons, but it, uh, um, and a dermatome is, like here is the arm dermatome. One of the uh, spinal nerves innervates this entire um, uh, part of the, uh, of the arm. And uh, um, its uh, um, cutting of this particular spinal nerve will not only um, cut off all sensory feeling to this arm, the dermatome of this nerve, 
but also all the motor input. So the sensory and motor kind of uh, um, uh, flow in a specific spinal nerve is matched. They're going to the same places. Okay, so here is uh, this uh, picture again, and now what we're seeing is um, a spinal nerve coming out. We're seeing the axon of a single uh, neuron uh, within the spinal nerve. There's uh, multiple alpha motor neurons going out each individual spinal nerve. It comes down and you can see the termination in the muscles. Here's this person's bicep muscle. And here is, uh, again, these are myelinated axons. Um, we want, obviously, fast responses. These are myelinated, fast responding axons so that if you're a ping pong player or a tennis player, um, you can have very, very fast uh, responses or football players we saw at the beginning of the last lecture. Um, and here is the myelination terminating, and here is the neuromuscular junction, the termination of the axon onto these striated muscle fibers. Okay, and here is it. Here is it. Um, here it is in a, a larger blow up. Here is the actin and myosin, and here is the axon terminal. And this is where acetylcholine is uh, released. In the same way with. Uh, um, um, with vesicles containing acetylcholine, the vesicles release, and acetylcholine then um, uh, contacts the muscle fiber that makes it contract. Okay. Um, we call just a term that you should know, the alpha motor neurons in the ventral horn of the spinal cord are what's called the final common pathway through which the brain and spinal cord controls muscle. Um, so let me just clarify something. You remember, the, I think it was the very first lecture. I told you to um, close your eyes for a second and wiggle your right pinky toe, right? And I said there was this long pathway of a single axon that goes all the way down. It's not really a single axon. What's really happening there is by wiggling my little toe, I have neurons in my little toe area of my primary motor cortex. Those are wiggling. I'm oh, sorry, those are wiggling. Those are firing action potentials. Your brain isn't wiggling. Your toe is wiggling. Your brain in, uh, your brain in those uh, um, neurons in primary motor cortex in the cortex are firing. Those axons are long. They're not quite as long as going all the way down to your toe, but what they do do is they go from the top of your head probably down to the bottom of your back, okay? So that's still a very long um, motor neuro um, neuron from primary motor cortex. Those primary motor cortex neurons synapse on the alpha motor neurons in the ventral horn at the, at the base of your spine, and those motor neurons then go out and terminate in the muscles that are controlling the movement of your baby toe, and that's, uh, that is a very, very long pathway, um, per perhaps not as long as I indicated the very first lecture, but still quite long, and imagine that for a giraffe. Okay, still hugely long neurons we're talking about in the motor, um, in the motor uh, uh, cortex and motor pathway. Okay, so now we get to a really important concept um, in motor function. It's not just all about the, um, uh, the efferents going out. So efferents uh, are the signals from the central nervous system out to the muscles, that would be an efferent. An afferent signal is information coming from the outside in. So sensory information or is afferent information coming from the periphery towards uh, the central nervous system. You need to know the difference between an afferent and an efferent of the brain. Uh, of the brain. So in the motor system, we're talking about um, efferent uh, um, um, signals, and we think that's, that's the main thing. We have to get that signal from the brain to the muscle so we know where to move. But it turns out that even the motor system not only has efferents, but has important afferents, which is called, uh, which uh, underlies our ability uh, of what we call proprioception, which is the collect, uh, collection of information about body movements and positions. It's not all about commanding what we're going to do, but it's also about paying attention to where we are so that we, we can monitor what's happening and adjust if necessary. And we're going to talk about two different kinds of proprioceptive um, uh, um, uh, uh, mechanisms we have in the motor system, muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. Okay, so first muscle spindles, where are these? 
Muscle spindles consist of afferent and efferent elements. Um, uh, um, intrafusal fibers uh, lie within the spindles. Let me just show you a picture of this. Okay. So this is a picture from the book. It's a really nice illustration. Here is your bicep muscle. And within the bicep, so sorry, let me just uh, identify here's the muscle itself. Here is the tendon. The tendon contact, uh, connects muscles to bone. Okay, so if you have a torn tendon, that's really bad, um, but that is what's uh, connecting your muscle to your bone. Now, for the um, um, muscle spindles, the muscle spindles are within the muscle itself. And each muscle has two major types of fibers, extrafusal muscle fibers, which are basically the uh, regular muscle fibers, the striated muscle fibers and the infrafusal muscle fibers. These are the specialized muscle fibers that make up uh, the muscle spindle. And they're kind of in, inside the regular muscle and they're kind of uh, a cylindrical shape. So it's basically a muscle spindle is a specialized kind of muscle fiber. It's called an intrafusal muscle fiber. And this muscle fiber has um, sensory uh, um, information that is uh, obtained from this muscle fiber. There's two types of sensory endings, one that, that, um, that terminates on the middle of the intrafusal muscle fiber right here, and one that terminates on the end. These are called secondary sensory endings that terminate on the edges, and these are primary sensory endings. What these sensory endings do is they, um, uh, they uh, uh, sense stretch of the muscle. So let's say my muscle is here, uh, hanging out, my bicep muscle is here, hanging out, not doing anything, just hanging out, and I have a big book. Somebody hands me a big book, and my bicep muscle stretches. That stretch is what these afferent fibers are very sensitive to, and um, you'll get uh, activation. Um, at the beginning of the stretch, you'll get primary activation of the primary sensory endings. These sensory endings, these primary sensory endings are very sensitive to the dynamics of new stretches of the muscles. Um, and then the secondary sensory endings, those are more sensitive to continuous stretch. So if the stretch continues for a long time, if I continue to hold this book here and nobody helps me uh, um, do something with it, um, then that's when my secondary sensory endings kick in. Okay, and so what this intrafusal uh, muscle fiber does, what this muscle spindle mechanism does, is that it detects stretches of muscles, and um, uh, it can then inform the rest of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the motor system um, to uh, adjust accordingly. So we want to know when our muscles are being stretched and when they're not, and these extrafusal muscles are exactly what's what's doing it. Now, uh, so let's look at this for a second. So here is the extrafusal muscle, and we've plucked out the intrafusal muscle, or the muscle spindle, right here. Here the muscle is relaxed, okay? And there's not much activity. Just focus here on this top row, the muscle spindle activity. And here what we're monitoring, each one of these dots is an action potential. Let's say it's from the, um, uh, our primary sensory ending, okay? So these are action potentials from the primary sensory ending. The muscle length is just normal, but then we stretch the muscle. Something stretches the muscle, the muscle stretches, and um, the, uh, then you get lots of activity in um, the muscle spindle, telling, telling us that the spindle has been activated. And then what usually happens in other motor systems is the muscle then contracts to counteract that stretch. And then you get uh, lower activity in the muscle spindle. But look what happened here. This muscle is now significantly um, shorter than it used to be because it's stretched. And then we have a muscle uh, spindle that's the, same, that's the same length. So it's kind of hanging out there. It's, it's way too uh, long. And it's not sensitive anymore to stretches even of this level of contraction. Okay? And so that's where the, um, uh, the muscle uh, efferent come in. So here, each muscle spindle doesn't only have primary and secondary sensory endings that innervate it, but it also has what's called a gamma motor fiber. A gamma motor fiber, not an alpha motor fiber, 
but a gamma motor fiber that comes in. And what this does is it can, that it can control the length of the actual muscle spindle. So let's say you have, um, you have a stretch and you contract your muscle. Well, the gamma motor fiber goes back and contracts this muscle spindle to match the length of the rest of the extrafusal muscle fibers so that this uh, uh, stretch receptor is now sensitive to whatever length your muscle is. Okay, does that make sense? It's just going in and realigning um, the, um, uh, the intrafusal muscle fiber to the rest of the muscle. Okay, and um, let's see. Right, so we talked about dynamic stretch is what the primary endings are sensitive to and static stretch is what the secondary endings uh, are sensitive to uh, and we talked about uh, gamma motor neurons. Now, the second uh, kind of um, uh, proprioceptive mechanism that we have is called the Golgi tendon organ. The Golgi tendon organ is not within the muscle itself, but it actually sits, these are fibers that sit on the tendon uh, that is connecting the muscle to the bone, okay? So these are simply uh, um, sensory endings here that's monitoring the tension that you see at the level of the tendon, okay? So this is really a, a safety valve. If there's too much tension there, that is you have a really, really hard load that's actually pulling on the tendon that is connecting the muscle to the bone, you have the Golgi tendon organ, which is a safety valve. So let's see what happens here. Um, we have uh, the level, uh, we have a stretch here. And um, uh, when the muscle is stretched, um, and this is stretched a lot, you not only get activation of the uh, muscle spindle, but you get a stimulation of the uh, uh, tendon as well. And so at this level, you get Golgi tendon organ activity. And what the tendon, uh, this is actually only activated in, in more vigorous stretching, when there's actually tension put on the, um, on the tendon. And so what happens there is once the Golgi tendon organ is activated, you get signals back to the muscle um, that, um, uh, uh, that release uh, the, the, the stretch of, of the muscle and actually uh, releases tension on, on the muscle. So it's, again, a safety mechanism to try and um, uh, safeguard your tendons so that they don't pop off of your, uh, of your bone. Okay. so. Um, that is Golgi tendon organ. And one nice way to summarize um, what's happening, particularly for the muscle spindles, is to go back to a uh, um, uh, activity or, or an example that we're very, very familiar with, and that is the stretch reflex. Do you remember at the beginning, at the end of our um, action potential lecture. We use the example of uh, a doctor hitting your, your uh, knee and giving you your um, um, kicking reflex, right? And um, same thing, this is another example of that. This is a stretch reflex that we're going to uh, talk about. And this is a stretch reflex that is only happening within, uh, uh, between the muscles and the spinal cord. The, the uh, primary motor cortex is not involved at all. So what happens here? So I, I, I'll translate this for our uh, um, hitting the, uh, the knee example. Um, so what happens is uh, the bicep is at a uh, normal length right here, and you put a weight in the person's hand, and that stretches the hand. You know, outside force stretches the hand. And um, then these bicep mu muscles are uh, stimulated. So you, uh, stretching of the muscle, you get stimulation of the uh, muscle spindle response. And that goes in through, these muscle spindles also have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. Sensory, all sensory neurons are in here, really important ganglion right here. These uh, axons of these sensory neurons go and they, uh, um, they synapse uh, on the uh, motor neurons that control this uh, muscle. And so uh, what this stretch reflex is doing is this uh, monosynaptically sensory input is coming in, going to a stretch. This says, okay, I want to contract this muscle that's being stretched. So then you have a motor command going out and stretching, uh, sorry, and contracting the bicep muscle. But you can't, everybody can, everybody just contract 
your bicep right now. Okay, is that the only thing you're doing? Can anybody only contract their bicep and that's the only muscle that they contract? Is that possible? No. Why is it not possible? Yes. Exactly. Perfect. Muscles come in pairs that are like opposites. We talked about antagonistic muscles. What is an antagonistic muscle for your bicep? Tricep, right. So when you contract your bicep, you're stretching your tricep. And so when you do this exercise in the gym, you're contracting your, your triceps. Um, and so these are antagonistic muscles. So in a system like that, you can't just stimulate your, uh, or contract your bicep. This second neuron here is going to inhibit. This purple neuron here is an inhibitory interneuron that is now going to inhibit the um, um, neurons of, uh, sorry, not to inhibit, but it relaxes the muscles of the triceps, okay? So um, uh, this reflex is uh, a stretch is detected. You get stimulation of some muscles that causes a uh, um, uh, contraction of the bicep and a relaxation of the tricep. That's exactly the exact same pattern that we talked about in the beginning of class when we were talking about um, action potentials, chemical and sensory action potentials. The same thing was happening. What happens when we hit the knee? You get a stretch. You actually cause a stretch of uh, the muscles in the quadriceps that cause the same loop to happen, but now you are, um, um, you are contracting the quadriceps and you're relaxing the hamstrings, okay? So this is a nice example of a motor uh, a kind of spinal reflex that now you know how exactly these muscle spindles uh, work in there. So you think, oh, I've never heard of muscle spindles. They can't be that, that important. Well, that's what, uh, uh, a very uh, a, um, important physiologist, um, Sherrington, thought as he was studying the uh, sensory and motor system. So he decided to uh, cut off all of the afferent input, that is, um, the uh, 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 proprioceptive input from the muscles uh, back to, to the spinal cord. So these muscles had perfectly working efferent signals. The acetylcholine was working, they could, they could stimulate something, but he only cut these um, muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. So what do you think would happen if you did that? Anything? Would, would the animal or would you still be able to move around just five, fine if you didn't have um, input? Yes. Right, exactly. Exactly, your brain would have no understanding of what your muscles were doing. And so what would happen is when they would cut off all the afferent input from the motor neurons, let's say from the right arm, the right arm could, could um, uh, the, the um, acetylcholine, uh, sorry, the, the alpha motor neurons were going perfectly well to the, um, to the muscles, but with no afferent input, the animal stopped using that arm. Just, it just went limp. Didn't know what to do with it. Couldn't do it until the, they, um, they uh, uh, restrained the other arm and started training the animal. And with time and effort, the animal was able to slowly use um, their, uh, um, the, the arm that had been de-afferented. But that just shows you how important these afferent inputs are. It's not all about the signals to move your muscles, but it's about the proprioceptive information about what your muscles are doing that allows you to adjust and to continue to move. It's all done unconsciously, really, um, uh, that is the proprioceptive part, but it's critical to our ability to move and uh, to learn very complex motor actions. So that's why we spend so much time talking about both the muscle spindles and just two examples. Um, proprioception is much more complicated than that. We're really giving you two uh, uh, simple examples of how proprioception works. Yes? Yeah, if you cut off the efferent signals, the, the alpha motor neurons, you cannot move at all. There's not a physical way to get the acetylcholine to 
the muscles. Um, you can you can feel in the sense that you have the uh, alpha, uh, sorry, the uh, spindle afferents uh, coming back, but you can't do anything with them because what that does is it just helps you move better, right? But what exactly as you said, if you cut the um, afferents from the muscle spindles but leave the efferents, um, you uh, you can still move, but you have to be retrained to move because we're so. This is so integrated, both the afferents and efferents in our motor system. Okay, does that make sense? Any other questions about that? Okay, good. Um, okay, and then so these uh, that th those examples are um, uh, focused on the major striated muscle groups of your whole body, the muscles that allow you to walk, to run to play the piano, um, to do everything like that. Um, but there are, uh, as we learned, uh, a whole group of muscles that are controlled by cranial nerves. And that means that it's not, uh, the motor neurons are not in your spine. They're actually in your brain stem. So this is uh, what the book calls um, movements are controlled. Uh, uh, so some muscles are controlled directly by the brain. And you already know these muscles. You know them as the cranial nerves that have motor functions. And these motor functions are all related to the head and neck, including sternocleidomastoid muscle um, in, in the back of the neck. All of the eye movement muscles, which are the um, fast twitch muscles, are controlled by very specific neurons um, in um, the different uh, uh, cranial nerves. And so you should uh, re-familiarize yourself with the cranial nerves and which ones are motor, particularly the motor neurons um, important for eye movement. Oh, one last thing that I forgot to go over is, um, um, let's see, this, I, I really like this concept, the innervation ratio, okay? The innervation ratio of, um, it refers to the number of fibers, muscle fibers, innervated by an axon, okay, by a single axon. So compare and contrast. Let's say I have an axon that innervates 500 muscle fibers versus an axon that innervates three muscle fibers. What do you think the difference between those two things would be? What would, what would I use the, muscle fi the, the axon that's innervating 500 muscles versus the axon that's innervating only two or three muscle fibers. What would be the difference there? Yes? It could be fast twitch, but what do you think is the nature? You're, you're very close. What, what is the nature of those, um, of those muscles, the, the muscles that have uh, just one axon innervating just a few muscle fibers? Yes. They could be smaller. Yes, back there. Sorry? Finer. Yes, finer movement. Exactly. So. Yes. Right. Exactly. So. Exactly. It's it's the same concept. He was referring to the concept of convergence versus divergence, and. Um, but, but what you said first was exactly what I was going for. It, uh, you have to think about the, the um, finesse of the movements, okay? So try and write with your hand, and then try and pick up a pen with your two elbows and write. How, what are you better at? Writing with your hand, right? So what, what's the difference between motor control of your hand and motor control of your elbow? Right, uh, it's a uh, um, uh, lower innervation ra ratio. So you want um, a uh, small number of muscles to be innervated by a single neuron. And so it's just think about all the parts of your body that you have fine motor control for. And those are the ones where there is much more detailed innervation of individual neurons to small numbers of axons. So you can imagine your hands have very small innervation ratios. Your eyes have very small innervation ratios. But my quadriceps and my, my uh, hamstrings have much larger innervation ratios, OK? It's not, well, maybe dancers can, can refine that. But um, the rest of us 
Uh, but even dancers will have better uh, and more intricate motor control in something like their hand. Okay, um, so now we're uh, um, um, to the spot that we always talk about in sensory motor pathways, uh, sensory motor systems, I should say. What is the pathway? So we spent a lot of time comparing and contrasting um, uh, the inputs from the somatosensory system, the visual system, the auditory system, how they're similar, how they're different, how on those sensory systems, all of those sensory inputs are going through the thalamus. Um, now we're going to talk about how information from primary motor cortex gets down to um, the alpha motor neurons and finally out to the, um, um, to the muscles. And this uh, information is getting out through two major systems. <clears throat> In the rest of this lecture, we're going to be talking about um, uh, the pyramidal system or cortical spinal system and the other system that we'll focus on um, next lecture, particularly in our discussions of different diseases of the motor system, is called the extra pyramidal system because it's outside of the pyramidal um, system. Um, so what does the pyramidal system consist of? Uh, these are neuronal cell bodies in the cerebral cortex, primarily in primary motor cortex. Um, their axons and their axons that pass through the brain stem to the spinal cord, forming what's called the pyramidal tract. So let's see where that is. Here is primary motor cortex. Uh, here all these neurons in this gray area where the cell bodies are, are going down and they kind of uh, travel in one part of the upper medulla, they kind of make a little pyramid or a little lump on the uh, medulla that uh, we should have pointed out to you in your, um, in your sheep brain dissection. You can see the pyramids of the medulla in the brain. There's basically a bump on the, uh, on the medulla, and that bump is consisted, consists of all of the axons from primary motor cortex that are going down. At the level of the lower medulla, these axons cross over because like the sensory systems, right motor cortex controls the left side of the body and left motor cortex controls the right side of the body. And so that desiccation or crossing over happens at the lower, uh, at the lower medulla and that's called the desiccation um, uh, of the pyramidal tract. Um, the, the pyramidal trap, trap uh, uh, crosses over, goes down, and then um, what it does is these neurons are terminating in the um, ventral horn of the spinal cord at the level of the neuron that these uh, uh, primary motor cortex are, are innervating, okay? So that is what's happening. So you're, you're, um, uh, you're wiggling your right little toe and we start from the left side. Let's say this is the left side of the brain um, and it comes and it uh, goes over to the right side. We go down to the lower spinal cord way down here, and uh, this neuron from primary motor cortex uh, uh, then uh, um, synapses on a alpha motor neuron, uh, or a set, I should say, of alpha motor neurons in um, the ventral horn. Those alpha motor neurons then go out and exit through a spinal nerve and go down and innervate those muscles that are allowing you to wiggle that right, right um, uh, little toe. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, what, where is primary motor cortex? We talked about this. Primary motor and primary sensory cortex are on either side of the central sulcus. And um, here is something that you're very familiar with, a representation of body parts in the primary motor cortex. And just like in the sensory system, there is a motor, just like a sensory homunculus, there is a motor homunculus with certain areas that are highly represented. Why? Because they have very low innervation ratios, just a, 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 um, more neurons are controlling certain parts of the body because it has much more intricate control of it. And those parts, you can imagine what they are, the hand. And if we look at our uh, uh, cheat sheet here, uh, obviously the hands are very highly represented and the mouth as well because the motor actions of actually speaking are some of the most complicated um, motor functions that, that we can do. And some of us can speak very, very quickly and, and so that really uh, uh, increases this. I should say that both 
uh, the sensory homunculus and the motor homunculus are very, very highly um, 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 simplified uh, for these uh, diagrams. It's, it's more complicated than this is just the huge hand area. The hand area is more integrated and more intermixed with the wrist and the elbow and the rest of the arm than is, is indicated here. But this is a good way just to get a general feeling for um, 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 what parts of the brain are, uh, are controlling different motor functions. Okay. So let's talk about what exactly happens in primary motor cortex as you are voluntarily making um, a movement. And what has been studied in the laboratory has been reaching tasks. So animals are taught to reach or move a joystick in different ways. And in a reaching task, muscle cells change firing rate according to the direction of movement. So these cells are actually sensitive. These cells uh, fire whenever the animal has the, uh, is, is, is uh, moving his hand in a particular direction. And each cell has one direction that elicits the highest activity. And what you can do is record not only from one cell, but a whole array of cells and get what's called a population vector. It's a population analysis of what the brain is telling the body to do. And the secret and the key is, can you decode, without knowing what the animal actually did, what he was going to do just by reading the output of neurons in primary motor cortex? So here is an example of a neuron that was recorded in um, primary motor cortex as an animal was doing a joystick kind of reaching task. You can see he was instructed to either move the joystick here, 90 degrees, uh, 45, zero degrees, down, 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 all these different um, three, six, uh, uh, eight different uh, directions. And he had a, a joystick and we could tell exactly when he was making the movement. And what we're looking at here are five individual trials. Zero is uh, this point here in the trial that's going from here to here. This is time on the, um, on the x-axis. Zero is when his actual physical movement began. And each of these individual ticks represents a single action potential that we're recording from these individual units. So you can see that right before the animal makes the movement, the motor neurons are starting to fire, indicating or signaling um, a, a, a movement in a particular direction. And so we can look at uh, the pattern of activity whenever the animal moved um, up. Um, 90 degrees up this way, you can see a pretty good firing every single time. So let's compare that to when the animal moved here at zero degrees. No activity. In fact, this neuron seemed uh, uh, inhibited right before this movement. But over here, you see good movement, or sorry, good movement, good uh, uh, strong action potentials that are starting right before the movement, right before this zero point, and continuing on um, through uh, whatever to about 250 milliseconds after uh, the movement, but only for specific directions, okay? If you ask the animal or if the animal moves in other directions, this neuron is not firing. Yes? Why is it that the animal stops all the time? Yeah, because that is where the neuron happens to be recorded from. So this neuron, this one neuron, it's a single neuron. So this has sensitivity to movements in this direction. But another neuron, if I record it in another location, could have sensitivity over here, some over here. And this is kind of a, a broad tuning. You know, what, what if we had more uh, sensitive, um, we wanted a, a very specific signal. There are some neurons that only respond when uh, the animal made a, a, um, a movement in this direction. So you have a whole mix of responses of these neurons, some that respond for just a specific individual direction and some for a large range. So this is almost half of the whole you know, pie chart here. And, and um, uh, some don't respond at all. Yeah? So the kind of ideal response is to operate from the front end of the neuron. Yeah. You could theoretically find a neuron that has that response for every single direction on the neuron. Exactly. Yes, you could theoretically find a response. Uh, beautiful response like this for every single direction around, if you record around in the motor cortex. Yes, question. So, um, what happens if there is Over here? This one? Yeah, okay. So, he, 
yes, the firing of action potentials. For this one, um, as well as these, um, it starts a little bit before the movement and continues on after the movement. So, so you know, they're, they're still doing it. They're still probably uh, uh, clutching the, uh, uh, the, the little rod uh, there. And um, you can see this neuron has quite a complex response um, that differs uh, that differs in subtle ways in all these directions that it's sensitive to. So this one is mainly before the movement, right? And these continue after. Yes? So were there some other cars that were driving with the Audi movement or the Audi movement? Yes. Yes, there are overlap. And that's a really good question. There is this wide range of different patterns of activity that that what we're trying to understand again is this population code. All of that together um, allows the animal to do his movements. He's doing what he wants to do. He's going to get a you know we cue the animal go here to get a reward and he does that. Okay, and you have this wide range of cells. Some of them they're responding to all these different things, not just when he goes up here to get a reward, but when he goes down here to get a reward. And there's subtle differences and. All of that complexity is um, underlying our, our great you know, um, um, flexibility in all the different movement that, that we can do. Any other questions? This is really the first time we've gotten really deeply into kind of uh, neural responses. OK, so, so we're going to really talk about this a lot because this is a really fascinating uh, topic. And what I'm showing here is simply a um, sensitivity or directional tuning curve of, um, uh, of this particular neuron. So this neuron likes to respond uh, primarily at 180 degrees uh, uh, movement. And it has good responses through a lot of it and very poor responses out here. So again, you can imagine that this is one neuron. Other neurons might have a very sharp curve like this. Other neurons may be like this. Other neurons may be just flat like this. All of these types of neurons you can see in the motor cortex. Um, and um, so, so before we go on to, let's see, do I want to do this first or do I want to do my exercise first? Um, oh, OK, well, let's, let's, let's do this first. So um, imagine an animal grasping a, um, uh, a joystick. And he's going like this, and he's moving this way, and that way, and that way. Um, one question that motor neuroscientists, motor physiologists ask are, are individual neurons that we're recording from, are these individual neurons that we can get activity and measure their action potentials, are they coding for a particular movement, a particular set of muscles that go this, that, that make you, you know, go like this, or are they coding for a particular movement direction? That is, I can go like this, but I could also go like that. And I make, I make the same kind of outward uh, um, uh, movement. And so that's exactly what they tested. They tested a monkey here. Um, and he was looking at a, a monitor, and he got cued there. And with his arm, he had to move, his, uh, uh, move this apparatus to this direction right here. And he moved and rotated and um, did all the, he could do all these different directions. But the cool thing uh, is that they asked him to do it in two different grips, one grip like this and one grip like this. So you can imagine that when you are moving the joystick like this, you have different muscles being activated, but you make the same kind of movements versus this. Same movement, but using very different muscles. So the question was, are these individual neurons in primary motor cortex coding for the specific muscles that are activated or for the outcome of the movement, which seems like more of a cognitive um, outcome? And what they found was uh, some neurons coded for the specific muscles. That is, they differentiated between this movement and this movement. Okay, they, they could tell the difference. The majority of the neurons recorded did not differentiate between this and this. So that means these neurons were coding the actual outcome of uh, the motor movement, not the specific muscles uh, that were being uh, encoded. Okay? So I wanted to do a little exercise just to uh, um, 
get you guys to understand what's going on and kind of uh, 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 make sure that you, you, get, you get this, okay? So you guys in the center here, you're gonna be primary motor cortex, okay? This line right here, eyes are all cells that encode my movement over here, okay? Firing of you makes me go like this. You guys in the center, you guys are all going to be fire neurons that control my movement this way. And you guys over here are going to move, uh, uh, activity there is going to control my movement to the right, okay? So you can make me do three different things. You can make me go this way, this way, or this way. This is a very simplified view, but I wanted to give you an idea of what the whole cortex is doing, not just an individual neuron, okay? So how are you gonna fire? You're gonna go like this, okay? So you guys fire, okay, great. You guys fire, and you guys fire. Great, okay, so you guys are all action, you are all, you're all neurons, okay? And you have specific sensitivity, okay? So make me fire so I go this way. Great, okay, fire, fire over there, okay? And fire over there. Okay, so now make me go this way. Okay, good, so now imagine, I, am a, I, I can go and record, and I can record your activity. I am just, I'm just monitoring how much you uh, wave your hand as I'm moving my, my arm, okay? So I'll get a specific pattern of activity. If I, if I ask the animal to move his arm over there, I get no activity out of you, right? But once I ask you to move your arm, move my arm over here, I see lots of activity, or if I see, if I have, have the movement go through this direction, I see your activity. So that's very, very simplified. It's not nearly as simple as that because some of you are sensitive to lots of different complex things. Some, some of you, actually, some of you on this side are also sensitive a little bit to my movement over here. So you have a larger kind of um, uh, sensitivity. Some of you are very, very sensitive to only movement. And I have to do this in a particular way for you to fire. But the pattern as a whole is what's actually activating this set of muscles. And now we know that it's not just a set of muscles, but it's an actual motor outcome that we're, we're signaling. That is, it doesn't matter whether the animal's arm is like this or like this. Firing of a particular neuron will, uh, um, will uh, be similar depending on the outcome. Yes? Can neurons fire over? Yeah, any, any pattern is possible. What is your outcome that you're interested in? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I gave the example of making a, a movement like that. But you can certainly go this and that. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it is kind of topographically organized, but there are individual movements that you can do. And you know, imagine, all, does, did anybody, is there anybody going to fall for dance, that, that thing at the city center where you can get all the tickets to the dance? I mean, imagine all the different movements. Um, this is a modern dance. If you don't know about it, you should, you should go. Um, uh, modern dance festival every, every fall. And for $10, you can see all kind of the world's uh, best choreography uh, um, or dance troops. And you go there and you see all these different movements that people do for art's sake. And um, yeah, it, it makes you realize that, yeah, you, you can train your motor cortex to do almost anything. And the motor cortex of those dancers are very uh, different from our motor cortices if we're not you know, professional dancers. But the other cool thing is, think about you guys as the cortex for a moment. Okay, so you're controlling, your firing is controlling this movement right here. But it's only controlling the movement, you're in the primary motor cortex, if I have my alpha motor neurons um, uh, viable, right? So I have to have my alpha mo motor neurons or I can't move the muscle, right? So let's say you're still fine, you're still there, you still know what to do, you still kind of give the commands, but now I'm paraplegic, okay? I can't move my motor, my, I can't move my legs, um, or I can't move my arms anymore. This is what neuroscientists realize, that there's paraplegic patients 
that have damaged the spinal cord, that, that, um, um, that uh, eliminate the ability to have um, movement in the uh, uh, muscles because alpha motor neurons are, are, are done, still have primary motor cortex. You guys are still commanding these different movements. So what if we were able to actually read you out in the same way I was able to read you out? What would that be able to do? That would be able to read out what my motor cortex is telling my body to do and instead have a computer do it. So that's exactly what a neuroscientist at Brown University named John Donahue decided to work on. He was a classic um, uh, physiologist recording in primary motor cortex, recording in monkeys and tasks exactly like this, but realized that this, uh, an implication of um, uh, understanding primary motor cortex is actually I could read out your motor intentions. And if I knew what you wanted to do, even if you were shut in, even if you were paraplegic, I could actually read that out and maybe have a computer do it or a robot do it or control your, um, uh, your wheelchair. So let's look at this, uh, look at this video. which describes um, this ability. And what you're going to see is um, this is one of the first uh, paraplegic patients that was implanted with electrodes so they could actually record from large parts of her primary motor cortex, just like they were doing in the monkeys. But this time, what they're doing is taking that neural activity, trying to really decode it. And um, because she tells, it's not a secret, you know, she says, okay, now I'm thinking about moving my right hand, my right hand, my right hand. And they, they uh, figure out how to um, uh, decode that, that that means moving my right hand. And let's see what they're able to do. E. Hutchinson is among the first humans to have her brain directly wired to a computer. Years ago, Kathy suffered a stroke that left her mentally sharp, but trapped inside a paralyzed body and unable to speak, locked in like Scott Mackler. Three years ago, Kathy volunteered to have the same kind of sensors we saw in the monkeys implanted in her motor cortex, which controls movement and is located right on the surface of the brain. The sensors connect to the computer through this plug on her head. The system is called BrainGate, and it was created by a team led by Brown University neuroscientist John Donahue. If you look at this square, each one of these little black boxes is the electrical signal coming from one electrode in the brain. And each one of those is a neuron firing. Right. It's its electrical potential. It lets out a one thousandth of a second pulse. How well do we understand this language? We have a somewhat of an understanding. We know that there's a general pattern of, for example, left, right, up, down, even fast or slow. Scott, Kathy now has neural control over that cursor. Dr. Lee Hochberg of Massachusetts General Hospital is leading the clinical trial. We watched together as Kathy showed us what she can do. There's a handful of icons that have been placed on the screen. Here's Google, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and yep. here's uh, Mass General Hospital Stroke okay. Service. Yep. We're seeing Kathy moving this cursor with nothing but her mind. That's right. She's thinking about the movement of her hand, and uh, she's moving the cursor much, much as if she had her hand on a mouse. So if a patient who's paralyzed thinks, move my left arm, the brain fires those neurons. Yes. Even though the arm does not move. Yes, it's very surprising. It, it fires even though you're not moving. Cursor's still a little bit wavier some days. Moving the cursor with her mind is not as fluid or direct as using a mouse. While we were there, the cursor meandered a bit, sometimes overshot. But Kathy always hit her target in the end. Do you want to uh, play some music? All right. She'll click on it. Imagine squeezing her hand, which is the, uh, or doing something else for the click. And she just clicked play. Yep, she did. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And so, I mean, if Kathy can control a cursor, she can control anything a computer is connected to. That's the goal. The lights, the temperature in the room, even, even a wheelchair at some point. Ready to try it for real? 
In fact, Kathy has already driven a wheelchair. See if you can drive it right over to the door. They haven't let her ride in it yet for her own safety. But with monkeys adopting robot arms and a completely paralyzed person driving a chair, imagine where this could be headed. Fantastic. Very Great. good. <laughs> okay, so I think you could understand the, the implications of this. If you could weed out your motor intentions, you can have robots do things, you could, um, um, and it doesn't have to be paraplegics. It can be, you know, I think about turning off my lights. I don't have to press that thing on my, um, my fancy new iPhone. Um, and uh, lights will turn off. So um, we'll continue this next on Wednesday. <laughs>